Good morning, and God bless you as you begin your Thursday. I'm sitting in the corner of the sanctuary uh, next to the baptismal plot. And for those of you who worship at our Savior's, it's been a long time since we've worshiped together in this sanctuary. It's been a longer time still since we've seen the baptismal plot used to be able to welcome people into the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ and the baptism into his grace. And as I'm sitting here, I'm reminding about what is unique about the Christian faith and how it answers so many challenges that we face in our lives. I want to share with you a passage of scripture, and it doesn't talk about baptism, but I think there's a connection that I'll talk to you about after I read. So I'd like to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish of the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. You know, I think of different people and the things that they look for in this life and the, the answers that they have to the problems of this world. And there are some who simply rely on human intelligence. And it's almost as though that's their faith structure, that they have this deep belief that if we just study enough, if we just learn enough, if we just understand enough, we can fix ourselves, we can fix the world around us, and we can build a better world. And I'm all for in intelligence, I'm all for education and learning everything we can. There is a great deal to be gained from that. But as we've seen, some of the worst atrocities in human history have been committed by the people who are the most educated and the most uh, uh, well-read and, and respected in terms of their intellectual abilities, or at least in terms of their scientific knowledge and the ability to figure out problems. But it doesn't change the heart of human beings, that pride and vanity, the selfishness that keeps us at odds with one another and often takes the greatest achievements of human wisdom and turns them into ways to dominate and manipulate or even destroy others that we deem to be either unworthy or to deem to be our enemies. And there are people like Paul describes in this passage that are looking for signs. You know, they, they don't necessarily believe or disbelieve God. They're maybe open to the idea of, well, yeah, sure, maybe there's a God, I don't care, but I'm not gonna believe unless he does whatever, X, Y, Z, unless he performs some sign to my satisfaction I'll just leave it as maybe there's a God, maybe there isn't. But we're certainly not going to yield our heart and our will to that abstract concept. And so we wait for a sign, but even if the sign comes, it's like, well, that was a nice sign, but I still don't know if I trust it. I still don't know if I want to obey such a deity. And there are those who, who live by the rules of right and wrong. And the idea of people get what they deserve. There's rules, consequences. And that works great. I mean, there's a certain sense in which, you know, there are some rules that really do make life a lot better when everybody agrees on them and everybody works together to encourage and to support them. And things fall apart awfully quickly when those rules are not agreed on or when you have some who blatantly disobey them. People get hurt 
happens every single day in all of our lives, in all of our families. The problem with the rules, if all that we have is the rules, you know, Jesus said, you know, the problem for you people is not that you don't have enough rules. I mean, for Pete's sake, when Jesus was talking, he's talking to the Pharisees who came up with 666 word uh, rules for how to obey the Sabbath day. The problem is not that they had enough, they didn't have enough rules. It's that they didn't obey the rules that matter most. And you remember what Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Everything hinges on that. And the problem is, even when you reduce it down to just those two, we don't. And that's the problem. And that really is kind of the offense of the cross of Jesus. Because there's a certain sense in which God said, you want a sign that I am real? You want a sign that I love you? I'm giving you my son. I'm giving you his cross. I'm giving you his empty tomb. That is the sign that I have given for you for all time and all generations, who I am and how much I love you and what I'm willing to do to reconcile with you. Those who want to put their trust in human intelligence, well, you know, this world has been around for a long time. There's been a lot of smart people, and it just doesn't seem to be getting that much better. I don't know if that's your perspective or not. And there's a certain humbleness that we have to come and say, God, we keep trying to fix the world without you, but maybe the problem is in our own hearts, and maybe we need you to fix us. And for those who live by the rules, that's great. Like I said, rules are great, but who really lives up to them? If it wasn't for grace, we would all perish. And that brings me to this baptismal font and the water that we baptize and we welcome people into the family of God and Jesus Christ. This idea of grace that washes away our sins, grace that unites us and adopts us into the family of God and does for us what we could never do for ourselves. And yeah, to those who don't believe, who those who don't understand, to those who simply want human answers to human problems, to those who just want, oh, some miraculous sign, but they don't really care about God to begin with, and for those who simply want people to get what they deserve, grace and mercy, washing and forgiveness, rebirth, yeah, it sounds kind of foolish. But when we become aware of our own need for salvation, our own sin and guilt, those words are precious. And it is the very power of God that gives us hope and it gives us joy and it gives us peace, regardless of what's going on in the world around us. So if you've been baptized, I'd like you to take a moment and remember that baptism and remember the promise of God that accompanied with it that because of God's grace for you, given as a free gift, nothing will separate you from his love. And that is the power of God for you and for me as we start this day. Amen.